Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Today's special guest is Andrew Hunt. You know him as the director of Frostbite. He is now writer and director of The Inferno Machine, starring Guy Pierce. Now join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Mr. Hunt, to the Traversing the Stars podcast. So glad you can make it. Th- thanks for having me. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure. As our listeners know, we've been interviewing people from the movie The, In- the Inferno Machine for the last couple of weeks. Um, Miss Lopes, Anna Lopes, and Miss Iris Cayet, I think I have it pronounced correctly. <laughs> and um, it's, it's been a great pleasure. And I really am getting increasingly fascinated with what this movie is going to look like when it's complete. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what is the time frame for it? Well, you know, we don't really exactly know what uh, Paramount's kind of uh, their objective will be with the film, like when it comes out or anything to that degree. Uh, I know that literally last week we locked picture on the film. And so now, yeah, it's it's (laughs) been it's been uh, it's been a fun um, uh, post-production process. Um, And so now we're you know, now we're in the stages of sound design. Uh, score, uh, visual effects, as well as color correction. So it's kind of nice, actually, because, you know, for the last um, the last three and a half months, we've been kind of putting together uh, the film and just kind of, I, I like to describe it in this way, is kind of getting the bones down of the movie. Um, we avoid doing any kind of like uh, temp score or any kind of like color correction or anything flashy. Um, we really want to see how the film cuts without any of those additional supplements you know um and so then once you have it then you i I like to say that a lot of the times like music and and color correction and visual effects and all that stuff can can uh dress up something where you don't know what the real problem is and Mm. if you strip all those things away um and just focus on the actual edit focus on the performance find out what the rhythm are uh, the rhythms are with the different actors and you build it that way you build the scene the way the scene wants to be constructed, then everything else is just like window dressing, you know? And so we kind of joke and, and say that we, we always have to eat our vegetables first. Um, <laughs> and then, and then we can have dessert. And so sound, sound design, music, color correction, visual effects. To me, that's all dessert. If you've got something that's got really good, solid bones, as I like to say, uh, then everything that you put on top of it is, is only going to make it stronger. So how does it feel to be able to see that finish line in sight? Because, I mean, it sounds like you're closing in on really completing fully the, the movie. Mm-hmm. So, it's well, you know, the, the great thing is, is that it's I am uh, <clears throat> I really love being involved in every single stage. If I didn't like writing and directing so much, I would totally be a sound designer it's because I, I love the. The, the things that you can do in sound design um, is just unreal. And I mean, my cinematographer, she was sitting next to me, she would like throw a chair at me. But you know, to me, um, sound is more important than picture. You know, uh, picture gives you the information, sound tells you how you're supposed to feel about it. Mm. And so for me, it's so much fun uh, that I get to now shift gears and sit with sound designers and talk about, you know, in, in this movie, there's there's quite a bit of dialogue, but then there's also a lot of silence. There's a lot of times where the character is at home or the character is um, reacting to something. And to me, the the sound of a of a jacket, the sound of dirt under a boot, um, the way that the vehicle runs, uh, the the way the wind is in the background, like all that stuff is dialogue. You know, in my mind, you know, a squeaky chair can ask a question, you know, and so that to me is so much fun because you start to really bring a life to the movie when you get into sound design. And then when you shift into gears into into score, you know, and this is the one area that I've is like probably my my weakest of descriptions because i'm not a musician Mm. so when i'm sitting there and talking to um composers and my composer nathaniel levin say um i am just bombarding him with metaphors and uh and like kind of what i want it to feel like and and what we want it to sound like and and this theme for this character and that theme for that character and then you kind of let them go and you go oh god what's it going to sound like you know i'm both excited and terrified every time (laughs) i listen to a new cue 
uh, you know, and then you get into color correction where you're starting to actually talk about like what is the parallel arc of the film with the character in regards to color. And our cinematographer, Sarah Dean, who's absolutely amazing, um, her and I, um, you know, like she's been the lead on on that, you know, of course, on, on the visual sides of it, but also on the side when it comes to color, uh, because that's another kind of weakness that I have where I'm still color theory, I'm still working out. Um, and then finally, you get into visual effects where, you know, some of the effects are kind of bigger massive effects and then others is hey can we paint out the grip that's over there drinking a coffee on his <laughs> apple box because we didn't notice that when we shot it so i mean it's really you know it's funny because i've been getting a pat on the back quite a bit going congrats pictures locked and i'm like fuck you man i still got four months of work you know so i mean so as much as i like to feel like we've achieved something i feel like when we get into now we're getting into the the the, the nooks and crannies of uh of of the film um in the detail stuff and and it's just yeah to me it's it's great because it's all like it's all uh you know it's all dessert for me right now you think the audience realizes just how important things like the the sound design of a movie is because i think it's for some reason i think it's kind of under maybe underappreciated that people don't realize just how much the details of sound really is sound is everything i mean you know it, it's and it's funny because i my father once came into a mixing session that we were doing and it's funny that if you actually looked at a at a pro Tools session which is what most sound designers use as a software when you look at the top track, it's the video track. And usually it's just one track. It's the actual movie. Mm. And then you look at all the audio tracks that make up that shot. And there might be 50, 60 tracks. And it's one of those things that, you know, my, and my father has no connections to the film industry whatsoever. So it's always funny when I go in and I show him, I'm like, okay, for this 20 minute short film that I did, we had 150 audio tracks uh, to make this film. And my dad's like, Jesus Christ. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's every, but I think you're right. I think the thing is, is that the audience doesn't realize that. And, you know, and not, and, and really they shouldn't. Like they, their, their job is to hopefully be a participant in the story, to be sucked into the story. And, but it's the sound effects. It's the, it's the score. It's the sound design, all that stuff is what's really giving them mm. the creeps, especially if you're doing like a horror film or a thriller. Mm. I mean, you've got the information on screen of like what the characters are reacting to or what they're, you know, what's what's on camera, what's off camera, but it's the sound that really tells you how to feel about it because, and especially like if there's a specific type of score, that it's really twisted and dark, it's going to terrify you. If it's mm. a really uplifting emotional score, well, it's pulling something else out of you. Sometimes no score whatsoever terrifies the audience the most because they don't know how they're supposed to feel. Mm. And anytime when someone doesn't know something, the they always fall back into the fear mode. You know, what we don't understand, we're afraid of. So yeah. like when you, anytime you see a horror film and someone's walking in a hallway and it's dead silent, it's like, that's the most terrifying moment of the movie because it's like, mm. you're not telling me if the monster is going to show up or not. It's like, so I, I don't know. No one's, no one's holding my hand right now and guiding me through how I'm supposed to feel. And a lot mm. of the times, you know, the audience, they react to that, you know, more powerfully than with sound. So it's, it's, it's a relationship that I think the audience just inherently has with sound because, you know, it, it's, you know, it's one of the things that I think is like, a, as a filmmaker, it's like a lot of people spend way too much time in color correction and not as much time in sound design. Mm. And because at the end of the day, the audience will be forgiving if a shot's out of focus or if it's a little red or a little green or a little blue, what they won't forgive is bad sound because they're in their car driving to work. They hear great sound in their speakers. They're at home watching TV. They're hearing great. They're inundated with great sound. And if you give them shitty sound, they'll walk out of the movie and they're like, I felt cheap. And they won't tell you what they won't know why, but they're like, ah, there's something wrong. There's something wrong about this. And it's because of bad audio. You know, my, obviously my background is not in film. It's in comic books. And okay. I, I kind of connect the idea of sound almost like lettering comic books. I think where yep. you don't appreciate it until you see it done badly. They're like, oh, crap, that, that's, that's, that's not good lettering right there. But when it's good, 
you almost don't notice it. You just appreciate it. You know, on some subconscious yep. level, you just appreciate it. You know, it's it's an invisible art form. You know that um, that people I, and I know this because I've done a few comic books of writing and designing panels, and there is nothing trickier than where am I going to put the where am I going to put the audio basically? You know, um, in the frame. You know, and so yeah, it's an absolute art form because you only got so much real estate in that panel to be able to put information in, and you also need to give some information that's not a visual, right. you know, something that is, yeah, a word bubble. So no, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> and the other cool, great thing, like as you're talking about the music, the score, so the score does come so much later after the filming, are you trusting the emotional impact of a scene bef um, before you get to hear what it's going to sound like? And, and how yes. does that feel as a director having to just trust that the moment is right and that the music will be right? Well, I think, you know, it's funny. It's the, 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 it's, it's comical because a lot of the times my editor and I will say, oh, we actually, like my editor will go, I think this cut might work because I actually felt something. You know what I mean? And because yeah. the first thing you are before you're a filmmaker, before you're an editor, before you're any special technician or artisan in this industry, you're a lover of film, mm. you know, you're, a, you, and, and before that you're a human being. You know, and so when you're watching a scene and you're seeing a character at wit's end and you feel that, you know, I mean, we were feeling that in some of our rough cuts and we were going, holy shit, you know, like, and, and because I'll be honest, you know, I, I've, this is the biggest movie I've ever made. And the cast that I have in this movie, they're unreal. And so when you're just watching assemblies and an assembly is, you're basically cutting the scene really quickly together to see if it makes sense. If you mm. need any additional coverage before, let's say you leave that location a day or two days later, but even watching the assemblies, we're just going, my God, there's, you know, the, the empathy that we have for, for the different characters is, is really strong. And so, you know, our kind of thing is we really want the, the actors, the way it's shot, the way it's edited, the way it's paced to really, to really be the thing that is, that only helps the composer because, you know, my composer, like very, like lots of composers have been in situations where they come in for a job and the filmmaker goes, save us <laughs> because the acting is terrible. The cinematography is shit. The story is not very good. You have to save us with music. And um, and my editor has experienced that on projects he's worked on where they come in with all the footage and go, save us, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, and so we I feel that we're in a really good situation because we don't really need saved. Um, we just need um, it's more of a dance rather than triage. Uh, you know, and so it's great for the editors. It's great for, it's great for all the other people that are coming in to finish up the movie where your job is to enhance, not to save. And, you know, um, what guy is doing on screen, um, is unreal. What all the actors are doing on screen is unreal. You just need a little bit of music to accompany that. Um, or when something is surreal, when something is just batshit crazy or absolutely nightmarish, well, that's when you come in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, kind of going back to the initial part of the conversation with editing is that we don't want to be saved by score. We don't want to be saved by sound design or by edit. You know, if, if it's shot right and if the performances are right and if the script is right, then you're enhancing. And, and that's what we feel like we're doing right now. So when you are, or when you have filmed it, are you able to tell that the movie is good while you're doing it? Like, are you able to say, this is, I can tell this is something really special. While you know, it's, it. it's weird. It's like, it's, it comes in ebbs and flows. Some days you'll shoot a scene and like, I'll send a text to my editor going, fucking good luck, man. I don't know how this is going to come together. I have no idea how you're going to put this together, man. This is just, you know, and then you see the next day and you're like, it, it works fine. Um, there's other, I mean, there's other times you're watching a specific take and you just, you just get choked up or you just, you, you know, I, I, you know, as much as, it makes me feel good when I hear stories of like Robert Zemeckis when he would walk off set and they're like, Oh, so you think we got a good movie? He's like, I don't know, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and I, and I really appreciate that honesty because I think anyone that thinks that 
they're leaving the set feeling like, oh my God, I got it is a fucking liar. You know, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think the, the question that I ask myself every day when I would get in the car and drive home is, did I compromise the integrity of the movie? Um, and if the answer is no, we did not compromise the integrity of the movie, then that's that, then I can sleep at night. Whether it works or not, that I can't tell you until we get into the editing room and we put it together and we start to see how it actually is playing. But um, but yeah, I, I think that it's, you know, you you go in there with a with an agenda or with a with a you know, you go in there with what you're hoping for um, and it changes. It constantly changes. But what you just have to constantly kind of tell yourself is. Am I compromising my movie? Is the story being compromised? Mm. Um, locations will change. Lines of dialogue will change. The way that we look at something will change. Um, that's fine. That, that's, that's the fluidity of filmmaking. Um, but at the end of the day, if you go, okay, I don't feel like I compromised. And when I say compromise, I don't mean that, you know, is, uh, you know, I mean that did we do something today that hurt the movie? Mm. Did we shortchange something to hurt the movie? Um, did I let a department or a schedule change or whatever hurt my movie? And, you know, sometimes it felt like, oh shit, it did. And then at the end of the day, you kind of look at it and go, no, I think we're in the right place, you know? And so, so yeah, that's kind of, I mean, I'm giving you a long answer for a very short question, but that's, that's the kind of thing is like, you really don't know. Do you just listening to your gut at that mm -hmm. point And you're hoping that you're right. Now, you wrote and directed a beautifully shot short film called Frostbite that I really thought was wonderful. Oh, thank you. And it, it, it won, I think, I, I know it was it won, I think, 11 awards. When you have doubts in, in a movie, are you able to go back and look at the success you've made on something like Frostbite and go, you know what, I must be on the right track. I know I'm right. I've been successful in the past. You know, I tell you what, I've done a ton of short films and Frostbite is the first one where I feel like, uh, you know, um, you know, I try to, in like all the projects that I do, I try to put a little bit of despair and hope in the same and weave it together mm. and try not to, and like I, you know, even though I am I am the most pessimistic human being on the planet <laughs> when I listen to politics, I try to be very up, um, upbeat about the, mm. our species. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, but but at the same, but you know, with Frostbite was kind of one of those, especially the ending uh, for me was a way of going. You can weave both a victory and a defeat together, mm -hmm. and and you know, and, and and from an audience's, from an outside, from an objective standpoint, it's a defeat. You find out, oh God, your your family's dead. Um, but from a subjective point of view, it's a victory because she got them together. Um, and, and so it's, it's trying to find that it's trying to live in between a hopeful and a hopeless kind of mm. scenario. Um, and for me that was, you know, and I love telling stories like I, like I'm from, originally from Pittsburgh, so I have to make a zombie movie in order for me to keep my, um, uh, my Pittsburgh street cred. Um, but I, I love the idea, especially with frostbite was, you know, the great thing about like, you know, George Romero and, you know, um, uh, Zack Snyder and, 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 and a million other filmmakers that's made zombie apocalypse movies. Um, they made movies that I don't have to make. You know, so I don't have to tell you the zombie apocalypse story. I just have to tell you about a little girl and a zombie and her leading the zombie through the woods. That's all I need mm. to tell you. And I really love that because then that kind of you get out of the spectacle of it and you get into the personal, which is, you know, I've always not, not that I, I I've always it's always been very curious to me how much we honor the dead and, you know, like how we honor a corpse. And how, like, you know, you go to a funeral and there's that body in the box or, you know, they've been cremated and they're in, a, in an urn or that soldiers will risk their lives to go into enemy territory to recover remains. Um, even though, you know, from a very objective point of view, you're like, I don't know why we're doing this, guys. That person's not alive anymore. It's, it's their dead body. Right. But yet we honor our dead. And, you know, and my thought with, especially with frostbite was, you know, what happens when you find out that one of your loved ones is actually, you know, no longer, but yet mm -hmm. they're walking around and how, and, and you know, and, and how hard would that be to let go of the fact 
that they're no longer your brother or your parent or your, your you know, whatever. Uh, they're just like a walking human devouring machine. And so it's just kind of like, I always love playing with, with, um, with ideas like that, where I love taking an idea that has literally been done to death with zombies and going, okay, let's do something different with it. And let's make it, you know, and, and the thing is, is like, fuck genre, you know, is, is my whole thing. You know, the, you know, nobody came up to George Romero when he first started making zombies and going, now, George, here's how zombies work. You know, here's how a fictional, creature that are that uh, you know that doesn't exist this is how it works in the real world it's like zombies don't exist so you can make them whatever the fuck you want you know and um and so that's why i just kind of love taking um taking genres that have been done and twisting them and because i grew up on my, myself so this is how i can kind of participate with with like horror films you know if that makes sense and yeah and i, I think first I, I think it's only was eight minutes long i think something along yeah, those lines. it's about about 10 yeah 10 minutes but, yeah but 10 minutes and you did so much in those 10 minutes in that movie and, and i really thought it was a beautiful movie it not only was the expectations of the viewer um i mean it was just changed as you went along you were just like oh my god you know where, where, where are we going with this movie then you get to the end and you're like oh shit you know it just hit yeah. you it was, it was like it was like a, like a punch in the heart right there like right at the end <laughs> yeah you know i tell you the, the one person that i absolutely love because i love how she talks about the process is Phoebe Waller bridge when she talks about flea bag. And, and if you want to look at another movie, you know, uh, plays trains and automobiles, mm. it's, it, it's when you play in comedy, the audience, if they're coming in knowing that they're watching a comedy, well, their drama walls are down. You know what I mean? You know, um, like if you go in to watch Schindler's list, your drama walls are up. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, you're going to experience something absolutely horrifying and you're preparing yourself for it, you know. So you're kind of like got this extra armor on because it's a drama. Mm. When you're doing a comedy, the walls come totally down. Right. Because you're there to laugh. So it's almost like you're you know, you're so exposed in a comedy as an audience member. So to come in there with a little bit of drama to gut punch you that way. I mean, if, if I was to tell you before you went and saw Frostbite that there might be a possibility that you might be crying at the end of the movie, the walls would come right up, right? Mm -hmm. You'd be walking in the movie with your drama armor on, you know? Um, but because you see a picture of a zombie, you know, or the first couple of minutes you're seeing a zombie in the film, all of a sudden, the only walls that are coming up is the horror you know, armor, which is like, okay, I want to be prepared so I don't get scared, but you're not prepared to be emotionally moved. And, mm. and to me, that is kind of going back to the respect of the audience is that if I can give the audience something emotionally that they weren't expecting in a specific genre, then man, that's awesome. You know, because it, it just, again, it kind of, you see what Del Toro has been doing with monster movies for the last 15 years. It's like, man, these aren't just like these movies you drop your kids off to at a matinee and they can watch. I mean, a lot of the times we want to avoid reality as much as possible. And so we'll see children of men or we'll see, you know, Pan's Labyrinth. And all of a sudden we're, we're seeing more reality in those movies than what we see on any, you know, network news program. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great to, it's, it's really great to, to, to alter expectations for an audience. Mm. Um, and the most important thing is as long as you deliver on an emotional level, as long as they walk out feeling emotionally satisfied, then I've done my job. And I think what is the most impressive aspect of Frostbite, and, and I imagine we'll see the same thing in front of a machine, is that you have a wonderful handling of the moment. You, you know what I'm saying? Like these yeah. little nuances, like even at the end when you see the zombie and he makes it home, there's a look like an expression that you kind of focus on for a moment. You're like, does the zombie know he's home now? You know, there's something just right there. And that moment is just perfect. And it, like I said, that's the moment that hits you, I think the most. And I, yeah. and I think it takes a certain skill, I think, to handle a nuance like that than it does to handle, you know, that big moment. It's this little, the nuanced moment. I think that's even more skillful. I, you know, I, I think the thing is, is that I trust my audience. And I trust them more than anything. And, and I, and I always, 
anytime somebody walks over to me and goes, well, the audience, they, they don't worry. They won't catch that. I'm like, don't ever underestimate the audience. They are way more intelligent than anybody gives them credit for. Um, and at the same time, I like movies where I'm a participant rather than a spectator. Mm. And so I find it's the silent moments. It's the little moments. It's a look um, where it allows the audience to put their own, um, their own ideas into the film. It allows them to own it rather than them to be entertained. And so that's the one thing that, you know, it, like I love, you know, I mean, I grew up on Spielberg. I mean, there was nobody that can create moments. I think Peter Weir and Steven Spielberg are like the two filmmakers that can take a moment and make it like if anyone's ever seen witness Lucas Haas going over to the trophy case and seeing that Danny Glover is like one, like a photograph of Danny Glover. And, you know, after he's been looking at mug shots for the last five hours and Harrison Ford is on the mm. phone across the office and they look at one another. And I mean, I have goosebumps right now thinking about like, like Spielberg and Peter Weir are like the masters of moments. And, you know, and it's, it's those that I absolutely enjoy. It's, you know, you, you need the build up to the moment, you know, you need to have that, but then you need to just sit there and live in that moment and, and know that the audience is going to plug their own thoughts, mm. their own feelings into that moment. Um, and then and they walk out and the movie's theirs, mm. right? It's not mine. It's theirs. And, and I, you know, that's why I mean even when I and I'm not talking about the cast from Infernal Machine but I'm talking about casts in the past that I've worked with where you know because the folks in Infernal Machine were amazing and I'm not shitting on any actors that I've ever worked with ever so please don't read it that way but it's more of like I think a lot of times actors feel that they need to always tell you what they're feeling or what they're thinking mm -hmm. and you would walk up to them and go nobody tells you what they're thinking nobody tells you how they're feeling everybody's a liar you know no one you know I'm, I'm pretending that I actually know what I'm talking about right now. We're mm. all full of shit. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, what's interesting is when you're not telling me what you're thinking, because then you become more interesting to watch because now you're unpredictable and mm. I don't know what you're going to do. If you indicate or present what you're going to do throughout the entire film. You're the most boring character to watch because I know at the end of the day, you're going to, you know, you're going to rise up and say, screw you, man. You know, you're, you're going to totally do that. And I think like you look at like Jack Nicholson and Robert Downey Jr. These guys have made an entire careers out of telling you, look, I'm a son of a bitch. I'm an asshole. I'm a self-absorbed billionaire. I'm a son of a bitch. And yet something happens in front of them and they immediately go in there to save the day. And now they're in conflict because they realize, wait a minute, I'm not the selfish son of a bitch that I thought I was. I'm actually someone who cares. Mm. And so, you know, and the audience and, and the whole time you're watching stories like that, the audience is always going, Oh, which way is he going to go? You know, is he going to, is he going to side with the corporation or is he going to side with the little guy? Well, he's always going to side with the little guy, but I mean, but we, as an audience, the, the, the less we know, about a moment in some ways the more we get to put our own attachments into mm -hmm. that moment and then the movie becomes ours it, it kind of reminds me a lot as um my day job as a high school teacher i tell my students when they write show don't tell you know and yeah, it, yeah. it's kind of funny how universal it is between writing and acting you know show it don't tell it it's, it means more when the reader or in this case the viewer Gets to experience it instead of when you just tell them, oh, feel happy. And I was like, all right, thank you for letting me know. I got to feel happy. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and I actually, I teach film school. I teach uh, college students. So I know I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I share your pain and your joy, <laughs> you know, um, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's instead of saying the guy, you know, he's pissed off. It's like, you know, he, how does he handle, how does he handle a gas pump pissed off? Because how you describe how he slams the gas pump into the vehicle and squeeze and, and you know throttles the the grip, you know, and all that little information gives gives away character, tells you what the character is thinking, you know, care tells you what they're feeling, you know. And so yeah, show don't tell. I mean, you know, to 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 let you know, uh, to describe how a person walks in the room, sits down and orders a cup of coffee will, will give you a pretty good idea who they really are, not who they're pretending to be, but who they really are. And, and that's always more interesting to watch as an audience member. I, I think, you know, it's interesting that you brought up, you know, one of your favorite directors, Steven Spielberg, 
how surreal was it to be in the lot in 2007? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it's one of those things. I think the best way to say it is that, you know, um, you know, you, you, you're constantly in these different film festivals or contests and you don't win, you don't win, you don't win and you get used to it, you know, but you keep chugging away. And then you get selected to be on this reality show with all these other filmmakers. And like day one, I show up and I'm surrounded by everyone's way more prettier than I am. And all I'm thinking is <laughs> I'm not, you know what? This face is not made for TV, man. They're going to boot me. I don't care how good my movies are. I, I do not look, I'm not this pretty. I'm not wearing enough, enough scarves. Yeah. Um, and, um, and no, it, it was, it was this absolute validation because your whole life you're wondering, could I really not so much compete, but do I really belong here? Mm. You know, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I've been working, I live in Minneapolis right now. I've been living here for like 20 years and, and I've worked with a lot of great crews here and a lot of great people, but you know, I've never worked in LA and when I'm going out there and my crew is like 50 people, you know, deep, you're going, holy shit. Most of my crews in Minneapolis have been like 10 or 15. Mm. So I don't even, this is going to be crazy. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're getting passed in the back by all the crew and they're going, you know, and, and, and you could tell they're not bullshitting. You could tell that they, they really enjoyed working with you is to me, you know, yeah, I didn't win the million dollars. Um, but I walked away kind of going, okay, yeah, I, I, I made the right choice at 12 years old. This is what I wanted to do, you know? Um, and, you know, and just, just being taken seriously and, you know, and, and that's probably one of the biggest frustrating things for filmmakers is that nobody takes you seriously unless you do something. And then once you do something, everyone that didn't take you seriously, now take you seriously. And you want to tell them all to fuck off, you know, <laughs> because it's like, why didn't you back me when I was hurting, right, right. you know? And, um, and so, uh, so it's, it's, it's that validation, you know, and it can't come from a family member or a friend. Cause everyone my you know, my mom thinks I'm the greatest filmmaker ever, you know, and clearly and my mom was also highly disagreeable with the on the lot she's like you should have won i'm like no i didn't the right guy won <laughs> will was amazing his movies were always clean and always sharp and he totally deserved it but you know but when you have strangers that are giving you compliments i mean that it's it's so weird that it's it's compliments from strangers mean so much more than compliments from family in this business because they don't have to say great job right, they don't right. have to walk over to you and say hey man that was really cool you know they you know they can just walk away so it's so yeah it's it's, it's pretty cool so what lessons did you take from both being in the lot and frostbite that you, that were maybe tangible lessons that you brought into the Inferno machine? You know, I think with um, what I learned with frostbite was the fact that I could run a crew like that. I, I, that was, I, is what I learned with frostbite. My entire crew were all my students. So there was only me and two other people. Well, the actors um, well, the adult actors, I should say, uh, and a makeup effects artist were the only professionals on that entire project. I think we had like 55 students work on that across, you know, from production, pre-production, production and post-production. Um, I think I think what I learned, like what I learned on On the Lot was was keep it short, quick, get the idea across and move. Um, what I learned from Frostbite was starting to weave some different genres together and start to experiment with, with try not to make a movie that you could put in one box, mm. you know, uh, a movie that you could, you could say, yeah, it's a drama. Yeah. It's a horror film. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and you really don't know where to put it. And, and I kind of, my, some of my favorite movies, I mean, Jaws is the first one is like, you know, what is it, you know, is it a monster movie? Well, yes. Is it a drama? Yes. Is it a comedy? There's some parts that are hysterical. Yes. Um, is it, you know, political? Yes. And so you kind of go down the list and you go, holy shit, this movie's got everything, you know? And so you can't really put it in one box. Um, what I learned bringing those in, I, I, frostbite really helped me define my own voice. Um, so when I was coming into infernal, I was like, okay, I, I, I my worldview has, you know, gotten more and more, um, uh, defined as I've gotten older and uh, and I feel that it's it's not preachy. It's it's not you know. It's just just trying to present the world in a, in, a, in an interesting way. And so um, frostbite allowed me to you know to lean into my own kind of beliefs. And then uh, Inferno is kind of like you know the most personal thing I've ever I've ever written. So uh, you know it's it's just kind of it's allowing me to kind of be more 
honest with myself when it comes to writing. So for our listeners who may not know, what is the Inferno Machine about? I'm not telling you anything. Um, no, okay. <laughs> so here's, uh, it's like, I've, it's, it's so hard when I try to actually, def- okay. The movie is about um, an author named Bruce Cogburn, who 25 years ago wrote a book called The Infernal Machine. And it was a very controversial novel when it was first published. Um, and so controversial that um, 25 years ago, back in 19, and this movie set in 2004. So back in 1981, a 17 year old kid read the book and it inspired him to kill 13 people at a university. And so now we cut to 25 years later where our protagonist, Bruce Cogburn, played by Guy Pierce, is kind of a recluse, kind of a hermit that's kind of living in a nice house in the middle of nowhere in Southern California. And all of a sudden he starts getting these letters in the mail from a, uh, an avid fan. And Bruce is a Luddite, so he doesn't have a television. He doesn't have a cell phone. And so the only way that he can communicate with this admirer is by going to a uh, payphone and calling up the admirer. And um, that's pretty, I mean, that's, that's, that's the first five minutes. <laughs> and yeah, so that's, that's it. That's all I'm giving you. <laughs> so, I mean, like I said, it stars Guy Pierce, who is a phenomenal actor. I mean, he yes. has a lot of range. I mean, LA Confidential. If you like comic books, he was in Iron Man 3. Yeah. Um, uh, Mayor of East Time. He does so many things. Yeah. What is it like to work with um, Guy Pierce? And how does it, does it change you as a director when you work with an actor who you can have that much confidence in? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, and Guy is, is, I have learned more from working with Guy Pierce than I have done with anybody else in the film industry. And, and, I, and I say this because before Infernal Machine, I was working with actors that um, would show up on set and were waiting for me to tell them what to do. Uh, whereas Guy and Alice and Alex and uh, Jeremy, they came in with ideas. And I'll be honest, the first couple of days was a little a little jarring for me because I wasn't used to that process, but, you know, but then I just realized everything that guy would suggest. I mean, we, we would come in. It's weird because I don't, I don't think of guy as an actor. I think of him as a partner. I I think Alice is the same way. I look at Alex Pettifer the same way and Jeremy Davies. They're, they're not actors. They're, they're, they're collaborators, they're partners. And we're rolling in together and we are going to tell a story, you know, and, and, and there, there was, it's so much, it, it's funny. I'm the kind of director that preps on, I'm like, I prep like a motherfucker, right? I mean, I've got, I've got diagrams of blocking and everything, you know, I, the whole movie was storyboarded. The whole movie was everything. And when you've got an actor that comes in and goes, what if I move over here instead of over there? And you don't want to go, well, guy, I really want you to move over here because my storyboard <laughs> says that you're supposed to move over here. Right. And, you know, it's just finding the moments and just being bold. And that's one thing that guy and I would talk about every once in a while, we would talk about wardrobe and it's like, what if I just put this on, let's just be bold. And he, and he's right, you know? And so what I learned is just, you know, working with him was just how much there is this dance between the director and the actor. And, the actor is never going to come in um, with, with, with egotistical ideas. And, you know, actors like Guy and Alice and Alex and, and, and Jeremy, they're going to come in with very specific ideas because of the characters that they've been preparing for. Mm-hmm. And the preparation that they, that they go through, I mean, you know, the, the, the books that Alice was reading that her and I were talking about, about this character, or Alex, Alex and I would like spitfire different ideas about things. And Jeremy and I would be on like five hour phone calls about the voice of the characters you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're kind of doing this. You're kind of, your job as a director is you, again, this is my metaphor. I'm going to overload you with metaphors, but your job as a director is you build this sandbox and then you invite everyone to come into your sandbox and play. And they're going to bring their own toys, their own dump trucks, Mm. their own little action figures. And you, you, 
you would be an arrogant asshole and you wouldn't be listening to the movie if you said, no, 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 don't, I don't want you to bring any of your toys. I just want you to come into my sandbox. Yeah. No, you, you want them to bring everything in there. And all of a sudden you, you start to see the movie and the movie is not exactly how you saw it. It's now better because mm -hmm. now everybody is bringing in their own skill set, and the movie's talking to you. And then the movie feels real. It feels alive. And so what Guy brought and me working with Guy, like, you know, in many interviews, you hear Guy talk about, you know, it was the director of uh, um, L.A. Confidential um, that taught him everything about movie making. He's like, I, I learned everything on that movie. And it's funny. And like, you know, and I'm a teacher myself and I'm standing next to Guy at some points. I'm like, man, I, I can't tell you how much I've learned from just working with you on how this collaborative process between an actor and a director like my god this is like so awesome like because there's nothing cooler to writing a character and then having like an hour-long conversation with an actor that you've absolutely admired their entire career like they're going deeper into that character than what you did when you wrote it and you can't help but have a little bit of this arrogant egotistical like oh this is great but at the same time you're also just like man we're in it you know like we are we are in it and um and that playfulness and that energy i mean there is nothing that tops that was it hard to initially give up that control and let someone else's voice be a voice in the movie you, actually, you don't know it wasn't. And, and I'll tell you why is that when I first arrived to Portugal, like five weeks before we were shooting and the locations were not the same locations I had in my mind's eye. And it was, it was, it, it, it probably happened during location scouting where you just go, okay, your mind's eye wants this location. This location does not exist in Portugal. Now we could do one or two things. We could sit in a corner and pout about it, or we can listen to the movie and the movie can say, hey man, we don't need an office building. What if we went with this? And all of a sudden you start, you're, you're like, you're really listening to the movie. And so as we were going through the pre-production and the location scouting and finding locations, I was feeling like my movie was changing and not changing in a bad way, not compromising the integrity. It was, it was morphing into this, it's its own unique thing. Like it start, it stopped being a no country for old men or any other, or any other movies that uh, the conversation that, um, that I, <clears throat> Francis Ford Coppola movie, it started to become its own thing. And I think it was that, that when guy, and Alice and Alex and Davy and all the other actors that came in. I think by that point, I was like, this movie, I just need to listen to the movie and, you know, and just trust that rather than, you know, that, I mean, cause I, I feel the way that I, I tend to work is, um, you know, everybody has seen tons of directors that run around and yell and scream um, and act like absolute dictators and assholes. And the reason they do that is because they're afraid because they're terrified that they don't know what they're doing. Um, and I always find that my job is to show up on set and go, I barely know what I'm doing. So um, let's just find it, you know? And, and even, even when Guy and I sat there and had a coffee before um, we started shooting, I mean, guys, the kind of person that you could literally look in the eyes and go, man, I'm fucking terrified right now, you know, and he's like me too. And I think it was that where we both kind of like, this is some scary shit. I mean, it's not scary. We're not curing cancer or like, you know, diffusing a, a bomb or anything like that. But for us, for the next five weeks, what we were going to put ourselves through is terrifying because what if we fail, mm. you know, and you, you just, you know, you just kind of. Um, you just, the, and the only reason that that failure thing plays in your head is if you let the ego, you know, if the ego takes control, then the ego is terrified of failure, you know, mm. but if you just kind of go, look, I don't know, man, we're just going to make a movie and we're going to find out what happens. And we just, just be true to the movie. And, and, you know, and that's all we can do. It's all we can do because, you know, there has been great scripts written that have been turned out and they're absolute horse shit. And then there's been like semi decent scripts that turned out to be great. And you never know, you can't tell, 
there's no real scientific equation to like what makes a good movie and what makes a bad one. Um, and so the idea was like, let's just make one and be as honest as we can when we make it. You know, I really like your description of movie making. It made it sound like it's almost like a living organism that kind of becomes almost sentient as you start, everyone starts pulling together in it. Yeah, because you're, I mean, you're all creating something. And the, and the biggest poison pills in creation is ego. You know, um, if the director starts to feel like, oh my God, I need to insert myself and show dominance. Well, they, fuck man. Then, then the movie starts to fall apart. If the cinematographer is just interested in beautiful pictures and not interested interested in actual coverage that you know is showing like the true emotion of what a character is going through same exact thing i mean i think the thing is all across the board you know and, and it really starts with guy i'll be i mean yeah as soon as guy gets on there and they see a take of what guy's doing everyone's expectations of what they need to do just bumps up right because they're going holy shit this is amazing you know and so it fuels everyone for the next shot. And then he does something amazing again. And then the next shot and he does something amazing again. And the audience is riding, or I mean, not the, the crew is riding this high on what guy is doing and what Sarah is doing. And, you know, sometimes what I'm doing, you know? Um, and so, but yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the biggest poison pill in a film set is the ego. And if you just listen to the movie and let the movie just be itself, you know, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great ride. And I'd imagine, I mean, I imagine the same thing with comic books, you know, it's like you draw a line, uh, you know, my partner in crime, she's an illustrator and an artist mm. and, you know, and I have the utmost like, I mean, I don't know how you guys do it because it pisses me off because I can't draw that. You could literally create something in 10 minutes. And anytime I create something, it takes three years. <laughs> um, but it's like you defining that line and you didn't think of that line before you drew it. And then you drew it. And all of a sudden that line is now making a statement and that line will then make us, then there'll be a secondary statement off of that line. And the next thing, you know, you're just following this line to create the shape of something that if you, the artist would, would have been really more dictatorial about it, that line might not ever exist. I don't know if that makes sense or not. No, I think it makes complete sense. I mean, having made comic books, I think, it, it you can tell when the team is all engaged completely because yeah. uh, um I, I'm, I'm a writer creator I'm, I'm not the artist so i have to pay someone to do the art for me and you can tell when you're working with an artist who's kind of just your mercenary coming in does the page gets done and then yeah. when you hire an artist um for instance um on nightmare patrol i have an artist called frankie washington who is wonderful and he was a participant he had uh, ideas and questions and he had a way of doing things and then he, and when something like that started happening, you could feel the fireworks. And I think the comic book itself feels greater and brighter and smarter because you had a teammate whose energy is on the page. And I think you can always tell the difference. Absolutely. And, you know, and here's the thing that, I mean, I'm from the East coast, so I like to argue inherently. Right. Um, and I love partners that I work with that fight with me, like not fight physically, right, right. but like, like I, Sarah Dean, my cinematographer, I absolutely love her. Like, She's like a sister to me and we can fight, you know, and, and, and we do, you know, and, and it's funny. I bring that up sometimes to Sarah and she's like, Jesus, don't let everyone think I'm like really <laughs> difficult to work with. And I'm like, no, you're not difficult to work with. You're passionate about what you do and you believe in your ideas and you, and if you feel that my idea is not strong enough, you'll challenge it. And I love that because I find a lot of the times people will look at either the creator or the, 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 the basically either the creator or the director is, well, we're going to do what you say, you know? Um, and the problem is, is that there are no Kubricks in the world. Right. So, you know, and even Kubrick wasn't Kubrick. If you read his like autobiography, his different biographies, the man was more insecure than any filmmaker, <laughs> you know? And so, so the thing is, is that when you challenge the ideas, it's great because it allows me to define my idea or define mm. the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And a lot of the times, if you just have a bunch of ideas in your head that are never being challenged, you don't know if they're good ideas or not. And yeah. it's only when someone goes, are you sure you really want them to wear this? It gives you that moment to go. And, and I tend to not be the kind of director to go. Yes. You know, I will go, well, yeah. And because 
I really want him to look this way because mm. this is kind of who he's trying to be and blah, 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 you know, because then it allows me, and it's not so much defining it for them. It's defining it for myself because maybe this is the first time that I've actually said it out loud. What, why I want mm. the sweater to be blue. You know what I mean? And, and so it's, and I find, you know, to me, those are the, those are the things that I love the most. I mean, if anyone heard had a microphone in the edit suite between my editor and I, you would think that like, we hate one another because of the, sh the, the amount of shit we give to one another. Um, but it's great because we had this playful relationship that we can be very honest with one another and, um, and, 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 you know, and challenge each other's ideas because I find that when you do that, there's these little sparks that hit off those ideas and that's the magic, you know? And so even when guy and I would have a difference of opinion, you know, or Alice or Alex or D Jeremy, I love that shit. I love it. It's uncomfortable. Absolutely. Mm. But when you're coming in from one point of view and they're coming in from another point of view and you feel that impasse, that impasse, there's, there's something there. Mm. And you could either try to ignore it and run away and pretend that that never happened or you could butt heads a little bit mm. and find out what it is. And most likely you're going to get something better than what you thought of and what they thought of. So it's, but again, that all comes from trying to like castrate the ego uh, before you work on a project so that there it's working for you, not against you. You know, and one great thing about having someone on a project that's arguing with you, especially when it's not their projects, your project to start with is that they were, in, involved enough and engaged enough in the project to care enough to argue with you. That says something about the project too. Absolutely. That they care that much. I mean, most people be like, whatever, whatever. If that's what you want, whatever. Fuck it. That's what you want. Yeah. I don't care. Just do the damn thing that you want. But they have them go, no, 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 no. How about this? And really get into it. You're like, holy shit, they're invested and they're loving this project as much as I am because they care enough to fight with me. That's something. The worst thing a person can say to me is not fuck off. It's okay, whatever. Yes. Like, okay, whatever tells me that they're indifferent. And there is nothing that infuriates me more than indifference. You know, indifference to me is like, was it a, a song from the Lumineers? They're the, the opposite of love is indifference, which I couldn't agree with more. At least you're passionate when you hate somebody, you know? <laughs> uh, you know and so, so no, you're exactly right. And see what I find. Okay. So it's, it's a little manipulative, but manipulative in a positive way is you're on a film set and somebody walks over to you and goes, Hey, Andy, what if they did this instead of that? And, and it's, and it's not even their department, right? It's like props or the AD, you know, gives you an idea and you process the idea and you go, Holy shit, that actually is a pretty good idea. And then I'll say, Hey guy, could we try you going from this to this over here? Lori threw this idea at me and I absolutely love it. What do you think? And he's like, I reckon I'll give it a try. And I'm like, great. And then, then guy will give it a try. And then I'll look over at Lori and go, damn, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and all of a sudden what you've done. And that's why I say it's, it's kind of like this positive manipulation, but, but it kind of is. You're listening to your crew and you're listening to the people you're collaborating with. They're trusting you with an idea. You take the idea, you process the idea and go, oh my God, this is actually a really good idea. Then you apply the idea and you th then the last part is the part that we have to do, which is you let everybody know whose idea it was. Because as soon as you call that out, especially for some bullshit reason, the director you know, again, people think that you know, it's, I'm harsher on directors than I am on anyone. Um, <laughs> when you call that out and go, man, that was Lori's idea. Now all of a sudden Lori's got more skin in the game. You know, now it's not just a project, you know, because Lori, uh, I'm not speaking for Lori, but I, if I, if, if I was, he would be calling me up, bitching me out right now with his, uh, with his, his accent, his British accent. Um, but the thing is, is that because most crews work with insecure directors and directors who are incredibly rude and cruel and just dismissive and disrespectful to their crews. So when you do it to your crew and you go, that's a great idea. This was Tom's idea, or this was Bob's idea, or this is Jane's idea. They're not used to that. Um, and it makes it even better because all of a sudden everyone's got skin in the game. And th then, then when it comes to those days where we got to climb this mountain guys to put the camera up here and we got to go through some serious shit they'll look at you and go, yeah, that's okay. You know, they know it's tough, but they also know that they're loved. 
um, and that they're respected. And, um, and if you can, if you can do that with your crew, you know, you can, you know, you don't ever abuse it. You never abuse that, that, um, that factor, but you know, that they're in it with you till the end. And, um, and if you do have a crazy request, they're more likely to kind of go, okay, yep, we're in, um, then go fuck yourself, <laughs> you know? So that's kind of the idea. You know, um, I, like I said, I had a, a great conversation um, about a week ago with Iris, um, kind of talking about uh, the Inferno Machine, yeah. and that, it, that it was shot in Portugal. And yes. the, the one thing that she said to me that it kind of stuck in my, in my brain, I wanted to ask you about it, because uh, we're talking about Portugal, and I had thought that um, it was said in Portugal, because um, I didn't know the detail of that part. She said yeah. that um, Portugal, she described Portugal as a culture, and I believe um, she, uh, the phrase is, strives on longing in the past. And because the story the way it sets with the idea of obsession and the fan and um, the past, was that part of the decision to shoot the movie in Portugal? No, you no, know, the, the, I wish that I could give you a very eloquent, eloquent, uh, you know, um, artistic answer of why we shot in Portugal, but it boils down to money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I was, I was listening to this one uh, podcast, this director and there, and he said, you know, I don't tell people that I direct anymore. I tell them that I chase uh, film rebates all around the world. <laughs> it's, it's what I do for a living. Um, no, we, we, um, the, the producer Lionel Hicks, uh, you know, we had been working on this project and trying to figure out where we we're going to shoot it. And his brother, um, uh, Julian Hicks, has been building this uh, studio down in Portugal called Movie Box. And so Lionel called me up one day and went, could we make this movie in Portugal? And originally the script was set like outside of uh, Las Vegas. So it's kind of like out in Nevada, the Nevada deserts. And, you know, Lionel went, could, could we shoot this in Portugal? And I'm like, well, I don't want to give you an answer because I, I don't don't put me on the spot, but give me a week. And, uh, you know, my partner and I, we had bought, which I think I highly recommend this to anyone if they want to go location scouting, but they can't afford a plane ticket somewhere. And especially during COVID, we couldn't fly anywhere. Um, I bought one of those uh, um, Oculus um, uh, quests, like the, the VR goggles. And there was an app called Wanderer that used Google Maps, like the, the street view. So literally, I was putting these Google, this, this uh, you know, um, VR headset on in my underwear, standing in the middle of the living room, wandering around going, well, shit, this kind of looks like California. And then I'd hand the glasses to Emily and Emily would put them on and she'd go, well, what part of California? So for us, it was one of those things that if I could, if I could get to a very close idea of like where in the United States, which we eventually went, it's, uh, it's about 70 miles east of San Diego and um, about 45 minutes north no, I'm sorry, southwest of the Mojave Desert, like that topography in California matched Portugal. And as soon as we saw that and saw the comparisons, it was like, yes, let's let's shoot in Portugal, you know, and or not not. Yes, um, I was more like to the producers. OK, I could totally sell my myself <laughs> on shooting in Portugal. And um, but 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 kind of what Iris was saying was really interesting because it, it, the one thing that I did you know, and I'd never been to Portugal before in my life. And uh, sadly, I'd only been to like the UK a few years earlier. So I'd never really experienced Europe. But um, I'll say this is that the Portuguese people and the country of Portugal are so proud of their history and they should be, you know, granted there's the Inquisition. Okay. Everyone's got, everyone's got one, right? Not everyone's got an Inquisition, but everyone's got some shitty history, but just the idea of like when the, you know, I remember um, Emily and I, we were in uh, Lisbon and we were getting the tour of the, the city and how they were talking about how when the Moors were conquered um, by the porch at that time or conquered that instead of their, their cultural heritage being erased, it was celebrated and it was embraced. And the fact that the Portuguese people would I mean, granted they were conquerors, but when they came in and conquered, they, they, they didn't exterminate the other cultures that they conquered, they celebrated and let those cultures infuse with theirs, which is one of the reasons why I think the people, the food, the locations, the art, the everything there is so fucking amazing because 
it is like, you know, we like to in America talk about the melting pot and everything and like how great it is. Um, but we don't celebrate each other's cultural, you know, we, we, we build nice little walls and, and say, okay, this is this and this is that. But you look at like the, the Portuguese, um, just their society and just the way that they, you know, they're like, yeah, they're, they're, they're the most passionate people I've ever met in my entire life. And I, I, I want to keep going back and making more movies there because I, I cannot talk enough about how much I love that place. I think I'd be envious just to spend any time in Portugal. I've never had a chance to go into Europe and I always wanted to. It's, you know, it's funny because like, I feel, I look, I love the UK, but it's, 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 it's a little uptight, right? <laughs> there, there is no one that can party like the Portuguese. Um, and there is just, I mean, you know, I, coming from Pittsburgh, the Italians were like the very expressive, very vibrant like that cultural, like, you know, and I live in Minneapolis now and, and I like to joke because we have a very large Somali population and they have that same, just absolute, just that, that passionate spirit where they don't talk um, quietly, they're loud and it's, and, 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 vote, and it's great. You know, you just feel like you're surrounded by, you know, discourse and passion. It's great. Um, and when you're in Portugal, man, I mean, everybody is like that. They're just, you know, they're just wired in this way of like, you know, that we don't just do something. We like lean into it and we do it, you know? And, and I, I man, I tell you, I, I could not, it was great. It was like half, of, like some of the crew was from the UK. Then the, then the rest of the crew, well, I'd probably say like 80% of the crew is um, Portuguese. 20% of the crew was the UK. And then there was like me in the middle um, as an American. And it was funny because every once in a while to hear the Brits, you know, they would, you know, they, would, and I kind of went, you know, I feel like I'm more with the Portuguese than I am with you guys. And they're like, why do you say that? I'm like, well, they're, they're, you know, they're rebels. And, you know, being an American, I'm, I'm kind of a rebel, you know, like we've been rebelling against your, your, your empire forever. So it's kind of, yeah, I kind of side with them. Um, so yeah, no, but it's, it, it's a country that I don't think gets enough credit when they think of Europe. I mean, you think of Germany and France mm -hmm. and all that and fuck that, man. I mean, there, there is so much to do in Portugal and you can get around pretty quickly and it's just amazing. You know, when, when you're filming a movie like the Inferno machine, which is very psychological in nature, is it taxing for you and the crew to exist in that mental realm for so, for so long? No, because we're very playful. Like, you know, I, I, I don't believe in, you know, if you're making a horror film to be full of dread, like I, I you know, there, there's something really fun about everyone joking around as there is like blood being spilled everywhere. You know what I mean? I, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, and especially with someone like Guy who can literally be on camera, do this amazing scene. And then I say cut and he'll just give me this look like, is that, is that good? And then he's back to guy, you know, and you, I don't know how the fuck he can do that. They're like I actors are like magical unicorns. I don't know how they do <laughs> what they do. Um, you know, but, but it's just it's trying to be as playful and fun as possible. So even though we're doing a psychological thriller, it was never, you know, like it would almost be like, you know, the moments leading up to us rolling is when things would start to get a little serious, you know, but going up to that point, it was playful. It was, it was hard work. I mean, we had mm. insane turnarounds that we had to do. Uh, but I mean, but it was never where, okay, everyone were making a drama. Now everyone brewed, <laughs> you know, it was like, let's, let's make a movie, you know, and right. have fun making a movie is kind of the thing. So um, if I'm you know, it's the completion of that movie is some months away. Do you already yeah. know whether or not it's going to be um, a wide release uh, will be streaming somewhere? I have, I have no, I mean, you know, I would love to say, you know, August 15th and theaters everywhere. I mean, that's, you know, I love to say that. Um, so, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, and especially, especially the climate right now, I don't think anyone really knows, you know what mm. I mean? It's like, uh, and, and, you know, not trying to give a bullshit answer, but like, you know, um, when Paramount came in and, and took the project, um, you know, the relationship that I've been having with them on the cut has been amazing. But the one thing that we really haven't talked about is, okay, so where's it go? Like, is it a, you know, is it a Paramount plus, or is that a Paramount yeah. plus plus theatrical, or is it a, you know, um, I, you know, I, there's, there's part of me that's like, you know, 
it's it's just to me it's a very special movie i you know it, it sucks to say like you know where it goes at the end like you know and but at the same time it's like you know you look at how everyone's theaters are set up in their homes now mm. it's like if you want a movie to really be seen you know stream it you know mm. Yet there's that part of you that's going, no, but I want the theater experience. And it's like, yeah, it completely makes sense. You want that because that's the ego play, you know, I mean, but at the same time, like, so I don't really know when um, I would like to think that, you know, we'll be finishing it. It'll be technically finished March of 2022. So we have about three months, a little over three months to finish the film. Um, I would love for this thing to come out in like August or September. Like that, mm. me personally. But then again, I'm not the studio. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they are going to decide, you know, uh, I, I would love to be in those meetings where I'm like, um, guys, could we, uh, could we release this on uh, September 1st? Is that, and then, and then they'll be like, who are you? And how did you get into this meeting? You know, <laughs> I, well, I wrote and made the movie. Well, yeah, that's cute and all, but please, uh, security, can we please have this man <laughs> removed? So, uh, so yeah, I don't know when, but um, uh, um, hopefully, hopefully at that time period would be great. And I hopefully you send me an email when you do find out. So I can post it be like, that's the movie. That's when it's coming out. <laughs> like, yes, post it absolutely. Everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, uh, trust me, I will be, I'm not much of a social media um, person, but um, I probably will be. And in like, in about six months, I'll probably be, I'll, 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 I'll be doing TikTok dances and shit like that <laughs> uh, to promote the movie. So, yeah. Oh, I, I've been there. Like when, when I'm promoting my podcast, I'm like, I, I gotta be social. I gotta do what now? Screw it. Whatever. No, I'm, I'm oh. dancing, singing, whatever. Get, watch my show. <laughs> you know what? I, I usually I like to think that I um, you know, even though I'm I'm kind of an older gen, I like to think that I'm still young at heart. And I remember when my students were walking me through um uh not Instagram, but um uh what was the one that like the yellow, like that looked like a ghost from Pac-Man? Is that Snapshot uh, or? Na yes, Snapchat. Oh, okay, Snapchat. So when they started walking me through Snapchat on how to create videos and you have to slide the screen over, I think that is when I went, holy shit, I am an old man. Like that, that it was, it was at that moment. And, and they were like, look, it's so easy. All you gotta do is you gotta flip the screen over like this and you flip over and you slide over here. And the, and all I could think of is like, holy shit, I am old because <laughs> none of this makes sense to me. And um, no. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that, that's, that, that was when I realized I'm an old man. Well, yeah. It, you know, I realized the same thing when, once again, when I, when, when I started, when I launched the podcast with um, my co-host, uh, uh, just uh, JD, Mm -hmm. Um, I, I spoke to my students, my high school students, I, like I said, teach high school. And I was like, so, uh, social media, what's the cool thing you guys do now? It's like, what do you mean? I go, do you guys <laughs> still use Tumblr? He's like, Tumblr? No. I was like, okay, so Tumblr's out. Uh, what do you guys actually use? <laughs> I was like to myself, I am like 20 years out of, you know, out of date on this. And, and I was like, he's like, basically use TikTok. TikTok is good. I was like, oh, it's okay. I'm making notes in my head. I'm like, all right, this is social media I'm promoting on. Cause apparently I'm still thinking 20 years, you know, it's like Tumblr and I guess Facebook is starting to phase out for um, promotion. I was like, wow. All Thank right. God. Thanks kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you know, it's funny. I am uh, when we, cause alter um, the, the YouTube channel that picked up frostbite, you know, which was great because we try to, you know, my, my YouTube channel is pathetic. Right. <laughs> and so when, when alter was like, can we, you know, take the movie and put it on our platform and we've got like 2 million viewers. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, there's a no brainer. And it was funny. There was one day, where you know i was i was just i was just watching like the average amount of views and it was like we were getting like 15 or twenty thousand views a day um this was like a year and a half after the movie was was put online and all of a sudden it went from like ten thousand views a day additional to like three hundred thousand. and i was like holy shit what you know and so i'm kind of curious i'm like there's got to be some kind of post somewhere in the interweb that people are then clicking on and going to watch Frostbite. And then the actress that was the, the lead actress in Frostbite sends me this text goes, oh my God, so-and-so on TikTok, TikTok likes us. And I'm yeah. like, what? You know, and, I, and then I went on the TikTok and saw this kid that has like 90 million viewers or some <laughs> crazy bullshit. And this kid just said, you know, one of my favorite, uh, you know, films this, this week, this week is Frostbite. And I'm like, the, the mere fact that that kid is generating, you know, and it's like probably some kid in Illinois that still lives with his parents. 
And that kid has more social media power than some politicians is terrifying. <laughs> but then again, politicians are terrifying as well. So, I mean, you know, maybe I would rather a 17 year old kid in Illinois, you know, control our fate than a, a you know, a 60 year old, uh, you know, politician, but, but still it was just kind of this craziness of like, just what that social, social media does. Yeah. I mean, my, um, my, my uh, podcast partner, uh, JD, he's pushing into take time. He's doing a bunch of stuff right now. I'm still like that guy who walks up to the pool and is like sticking my toes. It's like, it's still a little <laughs> cold. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this yet. Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll jump in tomorrow. I'll jump in T today. I'm just gonna sit by the pool for a while longer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. I, 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 you, you've probably seen me over by the bar drinking going, <laughs> I don't need to go in the pool. I'll, I'll make jacuzzi. I'll do the jacuzzi. <laughs> I'm not going in the pool, you know? So, so yeah, no, it's, it's, and you know, and it's so bizarre because you're just kind of wondering where, you know, you know, three years from now, it won't be TikTok. It'll be something else. And, yeah. you know, and, and it's really, it's really fascinating from just a, you know, of like, how do we entertain people 10 years from now? And, and you know, and, and how are people, you know, is our theater is going to be just a Marvel or, you know, Chris Nolan, you know, screen and everything else lives on Netflix and mm. HBO. And, and it's just really, really interesting to see kind of like, you know, and to see if VR filmmaking, you know, I, I've dabbled a little bit in it. And it's, it's like so limiting to a filmmaker because you can't move the camera. You can't, there's certain things you can't do with a 360 degree camera that you did when it was just, you know, like, I don't know what the degrees is of a, you know, of a normal film camera, but I mean, it's, it's really fascinating that you're kind of going, okay, what new techniques have to be created to mm. continue to tell stories and which ones do we, with the fundamentals and then the new ones. And, and there's just something really, I mean, it's really interesting and fascinating and scary. And um, yeah, no, it, it's something that I, I can't wait to be part of, honestly. Well, like I said, I mean, the only comparison I have is, like, like I said, the world of comic books, where eventually everything started moving towards digital. Everything's starting to go into like guided view and, you know, some other virtual. And you're, and you're just like, I'm not sure I'm going to what I'm going to recognize in 50 years, but I assume the core of what I like about the thing, just like with movies, is going to, per, is going to survive. You yeah, know, movies yeah. are going to survive in their core, you know, but in it, you know, the nature of them beyond that is going to be, yeah, it's going to probably be something we never even thought about um, right well, now. Some, it was, you know, it was funny that I had a film teacher once that um, uh, had a guy that came in who, you know, cause I was going to film school right when digital video was start starting to come into play. And, you know, all the film purists are all like, oh, fuck, who wants to shoot video? No, no, I shoot film 24 frames a second. Like these, you know, and this guy came in and he had this really interesting approach. He goes, what if I told you, you know, 50 years ago that there was this other formula to make movies besides film, like this one, you didn't have to wait and take it to a lab and get it developed. The audio could be connected actually to the, the image. Um, you know, uh, this would happen, that would happen. You'd be able to see an actual, the actual shot on set rather than a video tap, you know? And, and he would describe it in a way that he goes, do you, you mean to tell me that Alfred Hitchcock wouldn't be interested in that technology, you know, or that, you know, um, or any of, you know, or any of the filmmakers in that, like that Godard wouldn't be interested in running around with a, you know, with a airy um, LF, you know, mm. mini LF, you know? And so it's one of those things where I like, I even look at like, you know, with comic books and like, cause you know, the first probably were printed in just black and white mm. and then color came, you know, and same with film and then sound came, you know? It's one of those things that you kind of go, you know, there's the purists that go, yeah, but back in the day it was. And you're like, yeah, but I guarantee you that, you know, if, um, you know, if, if, if some of the artists had the things that we have now, mm -hmm. you know, if you went up and gave, you know, like, uh, um, God, I'm blanking on any comic book artist right now, which is really embarrassing. But I mean, if you were to go up to Dave McKean, who's like my favorite, like, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day and say, this is a Wacom tablet. You know, um, granted, I know that he's still working, but I mean, I'm thinking of Arkham Asylum and some of the other yeah. earlier stuff that he's done or Bill Sienkiewicz and you go, hey, you know, here's a Wacom tablet where you can now experiment and try even crazier shit than what you did when you were doing it all like, you know, back in the early stages when mm. Macs were out and everything to that degree. It would jump at the chance because it's like just a, another way of getting closer to kind of what you want to do. So. 
yeah, I, I kind of embrace technology quite a bit because I think it's it's going to be really exciting to see what happens next. You know, I, I, I try never to quote a meme, but I'm going to do it this time. There's only time in my entire life I'll quote a meme. It was, quote a meme. Wise, it was a quote. It, that this, it says, because it had to do with people who were concerned about how technology were, were going to affect like books, like Kindle affecting like the books and bookstore. And they said, um, the quote goes something along the lines of, a book is no, no more afraid of Kindle than a stereos of the elevator. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's a smart fucking quote. That's a it smart, is. You know? It's just a container of ideas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether it's a book or a a PDF, it contains ideas, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, and, and yeah, there's, you know, there are people that will argue with me that vinyl sounds better than, you know, um, Apple music and yeah. Okay. You know, I don't like the cracks and sizzles, right. I like, I like to hear it the way it was recorded in, you know, and, and so everyone's got their own different tastes on how they embrace I hate saying the word content because it sounds like a fucking, you know, like a product that you'd see on a tar on a shelf at Target. Right. But right. like, you know, it, but it's more of just kind of like you, how you how how you you experience that idea. You know, it, it doesn't matter what format it's on. You know, it, it's it's just experiencing the idea. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's I, I think. I, you know, and, and I think it's only going to and it's only, you know, the, the mere fact that you look at the cameras nowadays that you can make a movie with, you know, uh, are like a couple hundred bucks. You can you can get a 4K camera, you know, and so you're now telling a kid like Francis Ford Coppola made that joke in Apocalypse Now about, you know, the the little girl in Ohio, you know, that she might make the next great movie, you know, and it's like now with a three hundred dollar camera and, you know, a kid could actually do it, you know, and so. Yeah, I, the, the democratization of technology is uh, the only people that don't like it are the ones that, you know, that they're like, but I'm up here. So I don't like to it. You know, I don't want right, to. Right, right, right. I don't, don't want to share, you know, <laughs> you know, sh share the, the gatekeepers. Ex exactly. You know, and, <laughs> and, you know, the funniest thing is, is that when I first started having a production company here in Minneapolis, the um, the camera that George Lucas that was shot on the Star Wars, uh, not the last three, but the 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 one, two, and three, uh, the Cine Alta came out, and it was great for us because all the film uh, uh, DPs didn't want to touch it because it wasn't film, and all the video people didn't want to touch it because it just sounded too complicated, and so there was only a small group of people that were just trying to break out in their careers, going fuck yeah, I'll <laughs> use you know a uh, you know a 1080 P camera that shoots 24 frames a second, you know, and all the camera houses were going, well, it's just collecting dust on the shelf. So we'll give it to you at a discount. And that's how we all built our reels. So, mm. you know, it's kind of like, if you don't embrace the technology, you're just going to get left behind. I agree with you completely. Um, Mr. Hunt, it was a great pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Yeah. It, nice chat with you as well, Jeff. It, it, was, it was, it was a significant pleasure. And like I said, I'm really excited to see the Inferno machine. And I, I, I think the cool thing about doing these interviews, I can see the passion behind the project. And, and I really got to see it with this conversation. Great. Excellent. Well, hey, man, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. It's totally my pleasure. Have a fantastic night. You too. I'll talk to you later. See ya.